Well, if you know anything about me, you know I love to start in Scripture. And in this moment, we will be opening Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38 together. But we're going to start here in verses 46 and 47. And they read in this way. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices. Someone say rejoice. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I'll encourage us to stop there for a moment. I want to set the stage for this conversation by describing to you my instrument career, my music career. When I was a kid, I loved to play guitar. But before I started playing guitar, I tried a bunch of different instruments. I tried playing the recorder. I tried playing the piano. At one point, I even tried playing the drums. And to much to my dismay, all of those instruments didn't pan out. They didn't work out, and I never really quite enjoyed them as much as the guitar. Well, how many of us have ever heard of a child playing a recorder? Or parents, if you're bold this year, getting your child a drum set for Christmas. There's a lot of love in parents who give their child an instrument like that. And in the same breath, one of the loud instruments that has really fascinated me, one instrument that I never got the chance to learn, is the trumpet. And that's because the trumpet is really hard, not just to play the notes, but to get the correct breath to give a powerful and strong sound. The trumpet is a powerful and also an historical instrument. These powerful horns throughout history have declared the presence of kings and very important people, designating their arrival and declaring that all who are in their sound and are listening to them, that somebody important has arrived. Specifically, the fanfare trumpet or the herald trumpet was usually used to mark that arrival. And when someone heard the piercing noise of that fanfare or herald trumpet, there's a response expected for them to do. They were to stop whatever they were doing and bow down, for a king was coming. Often the pattern of the trumpet playing even could indicate who that king was and even how important they were. A trumpet is not just an instrument, but historically it means a lot more. Now let me turn the corner and bring that imagery over to what's happening here in Luke chapter one. Because what an image of the virgin birth. And when I say that, I mean that just like the trumpet tells us who the coming king is to the glory of their kingdom. And this is my main point, my big idea. The virgin birth tells us who the Messiah is to the glory of the one who sent him. The virgin birth tells us who the Messiah is to the glory of the one who sent him. Now, this virgin birth presents a challenge to us that not only because of the natural limitations we face, but also what it means. The one who was born to Mary is the Messiah, not born simply of natural means, but of supernatural ones. And this makes us ask ourselves the question, how are we to respond? How should we respond to this Messiah? Because if we're honest, many of us don't know what to do with Jesus. We don't know what to do with this God. Some of us consider him a good prophet or a good teacher. But many of us wouldn't consider who he really is, and that is the Lord of our lives, the Messiah, the Son of God. In these passages, we believe, present three thoughts that answer that all-important question of how we are to respond to Jesus. And the first thought that this passage addresses is that we need to recognize his deity. As I've mentioned, we're going to be spending time in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start here in verses 26 through 33 and then expand more of the passage together. Verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. I'll encourage us to stop there. Now, in order for us to understand what's happening here in this passage, we need to step into the scene to understand the context. The author of the Gospel of Luke is Luke, and he was writing volume one of a two-volume series. Luke is volume one, Acts is volume two, to a man named Theophilus. And he is providing an account for all he has seen and heard. And he speaks of an odd way for the Messiah to come to the world. That is because that God Almighty chose a virgin to bear his son. And he was from Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem, but he was from Nazareth. And Nazareth wasn't a town of status. Nazareth wasn't a well-recognized name. It wasn't a major hub in this world. But it was a town of significance, and that is because the Messiah was to be born there. The Messiah was born in a way that many people were not expecting. Many people would expect the Messiah to be born with pomp and with circumstances, with the declaring of trumpets, with the announcing and arrival of a coming king. But that is not how we find this story to be written. This Messiah was born in a humble way. And this childhood he lived was a humble one. And this proves that God was not bound to the expectations even of his chosen people. He shows his son's deity in spectacular ways, ways that go beyond expectation. And this expectation leads us to the first way that Jesus' birth was beyond expectation. And that is because this birth was a miraculous birth. We need to know what to do with a supernatural birth. Because it's not just hard for us to believe, but as we will discover later in this series, it was hard for Joseph, her husband, as well, or her future husband at this time. The birth that came to Mary is the first and only time this has ever happened. And we can believe it to be true based on who Jesus was and the life that he lived. Jesus' life was well documented to be a life of the supernatural, leading us to put more trust in the reality that his birth shared a similar theme. But Jesus was not only someone who was able to perform signs and wonders, but he was also, and write this down as point letter B, a child of the Most High. Luke's claims to Theophilus are upfront and right in our faces. He doesn't mince words or try and make it a vague idea as to what he is describing or who he is describing Jesus to be. Jesus was not just a good teacher, a healer, or an important historical figure. He is God. And he's not a God that's one of many, but he is the Alpha, he is the Omega, he is the One, he is the Only. And what we need to understand about Luke's gospel is that there is not any wiggle room in this idea. Luke doesn't try and get us to interpret this reality for ourselves. He declares what he knows to be true, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, that he is the son of the most high. And Jesus was not just somebody who was a great person or a great teacher But he is making the statement, Luke is, early and often, that Jesus is God and God himself in the flesh. And in his deity, he also proves, and write this down as point letter C, is that he is a mighty God. He is a mighty God. Jesus himself claims to be the son of God. And for context's sake, this God to the Jewish people was also the one who would set them free from Egypt. This God would be the one who throughout Israel's history would be with them and walk with them in a perfect covenantal relationship from his perspective and would guide them even when they were rebellious, who would show them grace and love and mercy time and time and time again. Jesus is the echo of Isaiah chapter nine, verses six through seven as the mighty God. And he is not only the one who would heal Israel, 
but all people who believe and trust in him would be set free and healed from their sins as well. He did this in a way that we wouldn't expect him to. Again, he didn't come in this brash or declarative way. He didn't make a bunch of people know who he was, but he was born in a way that was more removed. He lived in humility, and he asks us to do the same. We respond to Jesus not just by responding to his deity, but also, and write this down as point number two, big point number two, we respond to him in humility. Verses 34 through 38 of Luke chapter one read in this way. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For no word of God will ever fail. Verse 38 I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. I'll encourage us to stop there for a moment and write this down as point letter A. And that is that humility recognizes God's power over ours and submits to that power in love. The God of all creation, the one who put the stars in the sky and knows that all things chose in his divine wisdom to be born in a manger. In every way God could have come to earth, he could have come in a brash or a big way, but rather he came in humility, modeling for us how to live and who to look to. He shows us the value of a life-giving relationship and then gives us the greatest example that is his life. God did not come to the earth in pomp and circumstance, but in humility and surrendering to the task at hand. When we truly consider his greatness and marvel at his majesty, it simply goes beyond our ability to process We can't earn the love of God. We cannot keep on our own the love of God, yet it remains readily available to us. And this should humble us. This should make us realize that it's not us who is doing the earning of any love, but that is a free gift given to us in grace. Because we can't make God love us anymore, and we can't make him love us any less. When we are able to recognize our need for God, we are able to increase his dependence on him. We think of this dependence and we think of this humble way of living. It means that our desires and our ways, our thoughts, our motives take a back seat to his thoughts and his ways. And for many of us, this seems like a restricting thought. But in actuality, instead of a restricting thought, what we find is more liberty. And that is because the ways and the thoughts and the desires that we are living for in this life no longer become our temporal or our limited desires, but rather become his eternal and his unlimited desires. The ones for us that go beyond our imagination, our ability to even describe when God's ways are our ways, his glory will be at the forefront of our minds and our lives will be changed as a result. We don't have to look for our own way anymore. We don't have to live life getting our own things and desiring our own ideas. We can trust and be dependent on the one who is greater than us. We can look to the one who is higher than us and we can submit to the one who loves us. We do not have to be found in our own pursuits and our own thoughts. We can depend on and trust in the God of all creation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For many of us, we might be feeling the tension in this moment because we have thought that we need to look at life our own way, that we need to go after our own hopes and our own dreams, finding them to be empty time and time and time 
again. And rather than doing things our own way, we can trust the one who is worthy. We can depend on the one who is greater than us. In humility, and write this down as point letter B, our humility inspires trust in the one who should be trusted. The constant desire for us is to trust in ourselves. But in this passage, we don't see that response in Mary. Instead, she immediately looks to submit herself to the one this is calling this out of her for his glory. Mary responds in verse 38 with a proper understanding of her role. She is the Lord's servant and trusts his plan. What a place for her to be in. Because Mary was not focused on her own way. Mary had thoughts and expectations for her life, and no doubt this changed a lot of that. But instead of responding in a way that tried to get her to do it her own way or trying to get God to pick someone else, Mary humbly responds in a way where she realizes that all that God is describing did not depend on her. And that is a beautiful place to be in a place of simple trust in the Lord our God, the one who is greater than us, the one who is higher than us, the one whose thoughts and actions completely go beyond our imagination or understanding. That God is the one who offers to us in this moment an opportunity to trust him, an opportunity to depend on him, an opportunity to look to him, not only in the hard times in life, but also in the good times, not only the difficulties that life throws at us, but in all situations, we can find our hope, find our rest, find our contentment in the Lord our God. It doesn't have to be our own way, but we can trust someone whose ways are greater. And when we do, when we put our trust in the Lord and in his plan, and we begin to see him move This thing leads us to, and write this down as point number three, a place of praising God. In Luke chapter one, we are also going to be going through verses 46 through 55. And before I start reading, I want to explain what this is, because this is a significant portion of scripture. This has been known to many as the Magnificat. And it's a beautiful song that's birthed out of a response to all that God is doing in Mary's life. It's a moment for Mary to praise God. It's a moment for Mary to vocally express all that she feels God doing inside of her. And this is what she says, beginning in verse 46. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful on the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And I'll encourage us to stop there. What we just heard is a beautiful expression of all that God is doing in Mary's life. But if we just read it from a cursory glance, we could miss some of the rich things that are happening in this text. And this is what leads us to, and write this down as point letter A, I want us to picture someone who passionately worships in celebration. In this moment, we shouldn't picture someone who's passively writing these words saying, praise be to God for he's done great things. But rather, we should be looking at someone who's excited, saying, praise be to my God for all that he has done. 
We need to picture someone who is making the connection that God is fulfilling his long promised plan in her. In her. That the generations that have gone before who have anticipated this coming king, that she remembers all that she had heard growing up, and in this moment, she begins to realize that God is remembering his covenant. He is remembering his promise, and he is fulfilling that promise in her, and that bursts in her a celebration, that bursts in her praise, that bursts in her a response that says, I am not sure of how all of this is going to work out, but I know one thing, that I can trust my God because he is good. And that his plans for me will not leave me out in the wilderness. But when I trust him, he will do great things for his glory. And she spends a lot of this text rejoicing in God's plan. As I've mentioned, her heart leaps with excitement at the realization of what God is doing. And she is overwhelmed with praise to the one whose goodness and faithfulness is making itself known to her in a real and personal way. She spends time rejoicing in her response to God. She spends time celebrating all that he has done. She spends time just being overwhelmed at the beauty of his plan and at the glory of his graciousness. God has not abandoned her, but he's doing great things in her life. And not only does she rejoice in God's plan, but she also praises his awesome deeds. We also find Mary in this Magnificat marveling at all the great things that God has done and how he has provided for his nation Israel time and time again. She looks back to the history that she knew so well as a child. She remembers the stories of how God had met this nation in times of hardship she can picture in her mind's eye in this moment all that God had done. And now she is seeing another chapter added to that great story. And really the greatest chapter added to that great story in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she can't help but celebrate all that God has done. She can't help but just be blown away. And she expresses gladness towards his covenant-keeping nature. When I say the word covenant, I mean a promise. A promise that God had given to Abraham. And Mary is seeing how God's actions are in accordance with that covenant he made with Abraham. Which puts his nature and his plan into focus. This covenant that God had given to Abraham was at this point over a thousand years old. And in this moment, we see the greatness of our God because his plans are so specifically ordered. His love finds itself expressed so perfectly in time that this moment she is realizing in history will not pass her by, but that this is the moment that God is making his Messiah come to planet Earth, that he is sending his son and in this moment, she's beginning to see God's plan for his people unfold. She doesn't fully understand it yet. She hasn't fully put the pieces together. She doesn't fully know how all of this is going to shake out, but she does know this, that God is sending his son, the promised one who will deliver Israel. And what a beautiful moment she finds herself in him. And it was at this juncture that Mary began to see how God was making his great plan known to and through her. And she responds how she should, in praise. Not only is she praising in her own life, but write this down as point letter B. She praises because she recognizes God's faithfulness to those who have gone before us. Imagine with me the pure excitement of this moment and watch how she places this praise in the context of history. 
As I mentioned, she looks back at all that God has done and how he has provided for Israel time and time again. But Mary doesn't look to herself as the answer of God's plan. And she doesn't look to herself as anybody greater than she should. She did not have any resume to earn this prestige. She didn't have a background as the one who was qualified to carry the Messiah. No skill she had or prestige she possessed was the reason she brought this blessing upon herself because she didn't. God brought this blessing to her. And she was somebody who feared God, but she was also somebody who didn't know all the answers. And she responded to this news in a great and beautiful way, the best way she could in trust and obedience to God's plan. And I wonder how many of us are going to respond to the Messiah in this way. There are so many ways that God has made himself known to us. But this is a beautiful example of one of those ways. But now the question remains, how will we respond? And how will you respond? I've just listed three ways that we can respond. First, recognizing again his deity. Second, responding to him in humility. And third, responding to him for the praise that he alone is due. But that is by far not an exhaustive list. There are other ways that we can respond to God. And many of us in this moment might say, I'm going to turn my life around, make a sudden change, and do all of these things differently. That's not what I'm asking for us in this moment. Instead, I'm asking for us individually, each one of us, to identify one area in our life in which we can respond to God. Because frankly, we don't feel like we need to submit to him perfectly. We can't. We're on a journey. But the question remains, how can we respond to him in one way in this moment? Because we can ask God for help for us to see how he is moving. And we can choose to respond to his greatness. No level of performance ever made Mary highly favored. It didn't make her more prestigious, more great in God's eyes. God did not choose her because of anything that she had done. He chose her because his favor for her originated in him, in God, not in her. And the same is true for us. My prayer in this message is not that we would respond by trying harder, by trying to figure out everything that we have to do in life. It's not saying that we don't put these words into practice. Of course that we do. We try and respond to God the best way we can, but we don't just do it in our own strength. We pray and ask God to walk alongside of us in that process to help us be more like him. And so wherever we find ourselves in response to this message, my encouragement to us is not that we would try so much harder to be more like Jesus, but we would trust him more. We would look to him more. We would find his love for us and allow that love to be the catalyst for something greater in our lives. Not anything that's about us, but things that put the focus and emphasis on him. And when we are able to trust God in greater ways, when we can submit to him in more ways, it allows us to put the focus on him. We can ask God for help in studying his word, in surrendering our finances to him, in praying for friends, in sharing the gospel more with those around us. Regardless of how we respond, my prayer is that we respond. And it's not saying that we won't mess up in our response. It's not saying that we're gonna have it all figured out in response to one message. Rather, I'm asking for us to take a baby step forward. To look at our life and to say, Lord, how can I respond to you in one more way now? How can I respond to you in one more area of my life? 
And our prayer is that we can walk alongside of you through that, that we can be available to you in the midst of that. That regardless of where we find ourselves, that we would realize that we are not alone in the midst of this, but that there is a biblical community that is focused on coming alongside of all people, whether in New Hampshire or anywhere else in the world, and seeing how God can make his faithfulness known to them. And so the question still remains, how will you respond? And the answer may just blow our minds. Because when we trust God more, when we look to him more, we will find him. He will walk with us, not because of anything that we've done, because of who he is, what he's done, and the love that's present in all of it. And in this way, we can see God moving in our lives and trust him as the only one who can carry us through.